Hello, I'm Alison Large and firstly I would like to extend a very warm welcome to you all and thank you for joining this evening's webinar. This webinar will consist of two sections. Firstly, I'm going to speak about communicating with challenging people. And then within the second half of the webinar, Peninsula's Employment Law Business Partner, William Griffiths, is going to give a presentation covering misconduct in the workplace. Good evening. At the end of the entire presentation, there will be a short question and answers session for both presenters. Do please use the question function to type your questions in during the presentations and we're aimed to answer as many as possible as we at the end of the session. In the initial section of this presentation, I'm going to speak to you about communicating with challenging people. And primarily, this will cover difficulties that you and your staff may encounter in your interactions with patients. So firstly, just a little bit about myself. I'm Alison Large and I qualified at Newcastle Dental School in 1999. I joined the DDU in 2008 and initially combined working as a dental legal advisor with working in practice. I now work full time here at the DDU. So to help all members of the dental team be prepared for situations where they need to deal with challenging people, it is my aim to discuss the importance of good communication with challenging people to understand how difficulties in communication can give rise to complaints. We will all no doubt acknowledge that over the past year, our lives have been affected in all sorts of different ways. Before this presentation, you were asked if you considered the number of challenging interactions with patients has increased over that time. To this question, 70% answered yes. This is very much the message we were hearing as dental legal advisors from speaking and corresponding with members. It does appear that challenging interactions are becoming more common. However, these can still be unpleasant to deal with and can sometimes be very distressing for those members of the practice team involved. Issues can arise when patients' expectations are not met. Communication can be key to managing expectations. On the 8th of April, 2001, the GDC published Supporting the Dental Team, a guide for managers and employers. And within this document, it states that patients will have high expectations of everyone they interact with in a dental setting. Regular feedback from patients will help a dental practice or dental professional to better understand patient expectations. Listening to and acting on their feedback can help to improve services, leading to greater patient satisfaction and fewer avoidable complaints. It's therefore wise to keep in mind the type of information's, information patients can expect to receive as set out by the GDC. This includes full, clear and accurate information that they can understand before, during and after treatment so they can make informed decisions in partnership with the people providing their care. A clear explanation of the treatment possible outcomes and what to expect. They also need to know how much their treatment will cost before it starts and if along the way the treatment plan changes to be told about those changes. Any communications should be delivered in a way that the patient can understand and 
they should also know the names of those providing their care. Ensuring adequate time is set aside is important to achieving this communication. This is, however, often easier said than done. In the last year, practices have had a real overhaul in the way in which they work. In focusing on all the other aspects of the provision of care, it's important not to lose focus on still setting aside the time to have these discussions with patients. Whilst we may have become more used to the new normal way of working, it's important to remember that many changes may not be familiar to our patients. It's possible that an appointment may be the patient's first attendance at the practice since these changes have been introduced. Patients may be unaware of the arrangements and that they are now different. Communicating the procedures to patients in advance so they know what to expect is helpful, not just upon arrival, but also what to expect when they're in the surgery. Some patients may find explanations as to why these steps are being taken helpful and reassuring. For example, the need to wear a mask, being asked to attend unaccompanied, being asked to arrive only a limited time before their appointment starts the need to wait outside, and any completion of COVID risk assessment forms. An understanding that all patients are being asked to comply with the same protocols and why these steps are being taken may be of reassurance to patients. In particular, this may confirm to them that they are not being singled out. Providing patients an explanation may assist enabling you to achieve cooperation. There may, of course, be times when there might need to be exceptions made to assist with the delivery of care to an individual, and detailed discussions should be had to allow the practice to understand the patient's particular circumstances. Once again, a discussion about the reasons why their circumstances are individual to them and how their situation will be accommodated by the practice could be beneficial. Although this might take time, it can be time well spent. Due to the changes practices have had to make, discussions about clinical care within the clinical setting may be more difficult to take during the actual consultation. It may be worth considering exploring alternative ways of making time for patients. The practice may wish to continue to utilize telephone calls and video consultations to achieve this. In our previous webinar, we produced advice on conducting remote consultations, and this can be accessed from the DDU's website. As a practical tip, we advise discussing treatment options with your patients to involve them fully in their decision making process. Rather than just presenting them with a treatment plan, patients who feel they were involved in their treatment decisions might be less likely to consider, consider litigation. And this is even if the treatment outcome was not as expected. As a service user, it can perhaps be helpful to explore what makes you frustrated or angry. And these may often be things like service failures, a clash of personalities, fatigue, stress, health, and any failures to address complaints. If like me, in the last year, you've canceled or rebooked a holiday or flight, you may have experienced service failures, such as difficulties even making contact with the company. If you have, you will therefore appreciate that this can often leave you feeling rather frustrated. So what makes patients angry? Service failures, clash of personality, fatigue, stress, health, and failures to address complaints. It's really not surprising that the list of things that make patients angry is the same as the list of things that can make you angry. So 
Next, I would like to run a poll and I'd like to inquire which of the following factors most commonly causes difficult interactions with patients. And you can select one from the list. And this includes appointment availability and or delays, limited treatment options, treatment costs, complying with practice protocols, or treatment complications. So I will just give you a little bit of time to look at answering uh, that poll, those poll questions. Um, so just to run through it again, which one of the following factors most commonly causes difficult interactions with patients? Appointment availability and or delays, limited treatment options, treatment costs, complying with practice protocols or treatment complications. So I think that we're just still getting in some, some votes now. So I'll give it another couple of seconds or so for everybody to complete that. So I think we've got more or less everybody answered there. So I will stop the poll now. And uh, the result is really interesting. We've got 45% of you saying that it's appointment availability and or delays that is the most common cause of these difficult interactions. And that's really not surprising considering everything that's happened within the last year. Um, following closely behind, 28% of you voted that treatment complications cause those difficult interactions. And um, uh, in third place, 21% have said treatment costs. And these answers do reflect the type of issues that members have been highlighting to us. As was highlighted in this poll, it's not just the clinical care we provide that may give rise to patients having an issue. Unfortunately, it's not uncommon to find that although one particular aspect of the service the patient received prompts the complaint, they may often mention multiple other issues which they may not have otherwise complained about. An administrative failure could lead to the patient then also making reference to some other aspect of their clinical care as well. As a practice owner, you'll likely need to coordinate the response to a complaint. It's likely you'll be accountable for responding to the administrative aspects of the complaint, as well as aspects of the matter relating to the actions of employed members of staff. And that is in addition to any grievances raised about your personal clinical involvement in the patient's care. And this is where the dental team approach to diffusing the situation can be helpful and may actually prevent a complaint from occurring. So during the past year, both professionals and patients have been under their own stresses and strains. All the factors on this slide have perhaps become more heightened in recent times. And this could be the possible reason why people appear to have less patience and a shorter than usual fuse. More fatigue may occur in staff working under current conditions and with the additional PPE. Patients may also be more fatigued than usual. And remember, it's not uncommon for a patient to be fatigued if they uh, have not slept as a result of being in dental pain. Additionally, health seems to often be at the forefront of everyone's mind under current circumstances. If a complaint is not responded to, it's likely to make a patient very angry. Remember to respond to verbal complaints as well as written complaints. It's worth remembering that a useful definition of a complaint is an expression of disaffection that requires a response. It's sensible to ensure staff are proactive in dealing with patient dissatisfaction. A simple expression of a patient being unhappy may be able to be resolved at the time. 
It's not always possible, however, to deal with the complaint there and then. If more time is needed to investigate the matter or to allow you to give consideration to it or to involve someone else before answering it, it is entirely reasonable to say so to a patient. It can be helpful if the person who the complaint is raised to can reassure the patient that the matter is going to be dealt with and that they will receive a response. If a verbal complaint is not dealt with immediately, that's usually within 24 hours, it is important to have full and accurate written details of the verbal complaint. But it's not necessary to insist that the patient puts their complaint in writing. There may be someone in the practice whose role it would be to deal with verbal complaints. However, it may be worthwhile ensuring that all members of staff are familiar with the process of recording a verbal complaint and advising a patient how it will be handled. You may wish to ensure that you and all of the practice team are familiar with the practice complaints procedure, including checking they know where it is so it can be provided to a patient if it's requested. Failing to demonstrate that practice is willing to deal with a complaint, can it in itself become a complaint issue? Once a matter is being dealt with as a complaint, it's important to ensure records are kept and that the matter is dealt with in accordance with the practices complaints procedure. This would include acknowledging the complaint and keeping the patient updated with the complaint handling progress. All documentation relating to the complaint handling and notes of verbal communications should be retained in a complaints file, which is stored separately to the patient's clinical records. We are aware that the GDC now appears to be routinely requesting copies of complaint correspondence at the early stages of their investigation process. So it's important that it's fully documented and retained. There are personal aspects that can lead to challenging situations developing. You and your staff may wish to think about all of your interactions with the patient, both inside and outside the practice. One area to consider is the use of social media. The GDC has produced guidance on using social media and suggests you should think carefully before accepting friend requests from patients. You might want to take steps to ensure any patient contact is made through a professional channel, such as a practice email address. This will ensure any questions, queries or complaints are dealt with promptly and appropriately. This approach may also help to prevent that blurring of boundaries between professional and private life. On occasion, an individual clinician may make a decision about their own ongoing relationship with a patient. In these circumstances, the treating individual would normally be expected to communicate this relationship breakdown to the patient, give their reasons and make alternative arrangements for the patient's ongoing care. This may be as simple as the individual arranging for the patient's course of treatment to be provided by another colleague at the practice. However, it would usually be for a practice owner to decide if the patient's relationship with the entirety of the practice had ended. As a practice owner, you would usually be accountable for the decision made on behalf of the whole practice. And this decision would need to be in accordance with the GDC's guidance. Remember, before you end a professional relationship with a patient, you must be satisfied that your decision is fair and you must be able to justify your decision. You should write to the patient and tell them about your decision and the reasons for it. You should take steps to ensure arrangements are made promptly for the continuing care of the patient. Practice owners may therefore wish to have in place systems to allow information about patient conduct to be fed back to them. This means you can be kept informed and receive 
all the information necessary for your decision making process. As a DDU member, we'd be happy to assist you in formulating the written notification to the patient if you do have to make this type of decision. Although it's quite rare, there can unfortunately be occasions when an interaction escalates into something more concerning. This is an example of a zero tolerance definition as provided by the zero tolerance campaign introduced in 1999. It states, any incident where staff are abused, threatened or assaulted in the circumstances related to work involving an explicit or implicit challenge to their safety, well-being or health. Most practices will have their own zero tolerance policy definition, and it can be helpful to consider placing this somewhere visible within the practice. Ensuring that patients understand there is a two way relationship and that their expectations placed on them as individuals attending the practice can be a helpful approach to take. Empowering all staff to be able to deal with challenges from patients can also be beneficial. So make sure that this is part of the induction training as well as part of your update training for the practice team. Staff being able to signpost patients to the expectations the practice has of them can be a useful tool for them to use. Often simply highlighting to patient the practice expectations of them may be enough to diffuse the situation. It can also be helpful to inform a patient that if their behaviour continues, it may result in the practice no longer being able to offer them dental services. Such a warning may be sufficient and the patient may then conduct themselves appropriately. Alternatively, if, a continues, if an individual continues to behave in an unacceptable manner, having been provided with a warning about the consequences of their actions, it may be necessary for the practice to then follow through on its warning. So, all members of the dental team being alert to the signs of a situation escalating and recognising sign, those signs can be helpful. So, some signs of impending violence can include a raised tone and volume of voice, a red face, clenched fists, finger pointing, invasion of personal space, verbal threats or refusal to communicate and restlessness. Initially trying to diffuse the situation can be helpful, including active listening using open-ended questions, reassurance and acknowledgement and eye contact. It may reach a point where politely explaining the interaction is not constructive becomes necessary. You or the practice team member may well be able to assure them that the matter will be dealt with differently, for example, as a complaint. It would be important to explain that the current ongoing discussion or telephone call is simply not constructive, so it's going to be terminated. Putting down the telephone or leaving the room will then end the interaction. Some IT systems have a panic button to attract attention of other staff. If utilising this function, it would be sensible to agree on how it's going to be used. Warning a challenging individual that the next step would involve contacting the police may in itself be sufficient for a patient to discontinue their behaviour and leave. If a patient refused to leave when asked, it may be necessary to take action and then call the police. Giving consideration to how the practice team may deal with a challenging situation means that all staff may be prepared and able to deal with it should such a situation arise. Whilst encountering patients with high expectations or making demands are not uncommon, thankfully, when carefully handled, most difficult interactions can be diffused relatively simply and do not escalate into the type of incident that I've described on my previous slide. 
providing the dental team members with tools to try and diffuse or deal with these situations may prevent very difficult situations from arising as the team member will hopefully feel more confident in dealing with the interactions they may potentially face. Importantly, as a DDU member, you are, if you're encountering challenges with a patient or if you consider there is a potential for an issue to rise, do please pick up the phone and speak with myself or one of my colleagues. We are more than happy to speak with you, even if it's simply to try and manage a difficult situation before it develops. Remember, we're here to guide and support you. Advice for members is available between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. Monday to Friday. For urgent queries that can't wait until our normal office hours, we do provide advice out of hours. If you do find yourself needing to deal with a patient complaint, please contact us to discuss it over the telephone. If that's not possible, Details of the information to email in to us are on both our app and our website. So do please remember to type in any questions that you may have, and we will try to answer these at the end of the presentation. And as attendees of the entire presentation, you will receive a one hour CPD certificate by email and you can expect to receive this within the week. So having discussed challenging interactions with patients, Will is going to speak about challenges in respect of employed staff in his presentation, misconduct or misunderstanding. I will now hand you over to Will. Yes, thank you very much, Alison. My name's Will Griffiths, as Alison has explained, and I am an employment law business partner within Peninsula. Alison, can I just check that you can see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen absolutely fine. I can't see you at the moment, though, Will. Ah, right. OK, thanks very much. How about now? Wonderful. Yes, I can see you. Fabulous. So I am an employment law business partner working for Peninsula and I partner the, the DDU with, their, uh, with the partnership where you receive free employment law uh, advice from our advice, from our advice line 24, 24 seven. You would likely to speak to myself or my colleagues uh, within the normal core business hours. However, like I say, we are a 24 seven advice line. So if you were to call out of hours between the nine, a bit outside of the hours nine to five, you're likely to speak to one of my colleagues. So just as a general point, it's important to emphasise what I'm talking about today only applies to Great British employment law legislation. We do actually offer a support, support on jurisdictions, as mentioned here, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Jersey, Guernsey, Isle of Man. And if you have any questions in relation to those jurisdictions, then please contact the advice line. The session that I'm going to be delivering will last approximately 30 minutes and including an, a question and answer session at the end, including answers on the sessions with myself and Alison. And I look forward to welcoming those questions and answering those at the end of the session. At this point, it might be worthwhile mentioning the Peninsula 24 hour advice line and what you do need to do if you need to call. I anticipate that there may be some of you listening to the session today that are attending because you have an issue already that you feel you need, may need to deal with. On any burning issues that you have on specific cases, I can only urge you to call the advice, advice line. There is no question too small for my team. And whilst I may be biased, they're all very lovely, knowledgeable and understanding. And you'll, you'll definitely feel even better you called afterwards. Remember, the advice line is free as part of your membership with the un unlimited and unlimited for you to use as DDU members. Once you've dialed the number, first quote you're at the account number DDU, and then you will be asked for your DDU membership number. And it is really important that you have both of these when you call. 
as that that will make a smoother transition into for you receiving the advice in order for you to get on and deal with your conduct issues that you have within the workplace okay so moving on to more for on on the content today as you know, I've been asked to deliver a, a session on misconduct and misunderstanding, two quite common issues that arise within the course of an employment relationship. So today that we'll, we will cover an overview of mis misconduct within the workplace. We'll consider whether it's misconduct or perhaps a misunderstanding that's happened potentially between two employees or between uh, an employee and a patient. We'll look at the importance of a thorough investigation and we'll go into what that looks like and what that means and why. We'll look at the importance of drafting sound allegations. And also we'll look at an overview of a disciplinary and we'll go through a summary at the end. Okay, essentially there are three main parts when faced with an issue around conduct within the workplace. We need to look to act promptly, carry out a thorough, fair and impartial investigation to establish if there is a case to answer, and consider whether, whether a formal disciplinary action is appropriate. One important element of this though is to determine whether the complaint of misconduct is of a serious nature and or if there are concerns that that, that evidence will be tampered with. If no concerns of this nature, then you need to think about appointing an in, a trained management representative to conduct an investigation. Where possible, this should be that this person should not be involved within the dis, with any with any subsequent disciplinary proceedings that follow on from the investigation. If there are concerns that the, the conduct is serious in nature, and or if there are there are concerns that the evidence will be tampered with then you'll need to think about whether you need to suspend that employee. Suspension with, him, with suspending an employee will be paid whilst the investigation is carried out. Where the decision is, to be ta is taken to suspend, ask the employee to attend an interview. Make it clear to the employee that suspension is not a disciplinary sanction, but please be mindful that su suspension should only be for as a short a period as possible for you to carry out that investigation and determine whether those, the, the suspension is necessary to continue or whether you need to bring that employee back to the workplace. Analyse and consider the evidence as you move th throughout the investigation. Think about what you need to complete as part of your investigation. You may need to carry out investigatory or fact-finding interviews with the employee themselves or witnesses and gather any evidence from a variety of sources. Then we need to consider whether there, are any, there is a genuine case to answer. After investigation, you'll have to think about whether there is a, that genuine case and if not confirm to the employee in writing that there is no case to answer and they're required to return back to work as the employee is on, on paid suspension you may want that employee to return to work as as soon as possible and therefore it's really important that we um we ensure that a smooth transition is obtained and ensure that that employee feels welcome back to the business once that's that's been decided to take place. Always ensure that you complete case records at the end of the procedure. If there is a case to answer, you need to determine whether the complaint can re be resolved informally or formally. If it can be re resolved informally, then you need to confirm this to the employee in writing that they, you're going to resolve it informally and how you will resolve that. You may want to consider putting an informal warning on the on on the on the file. Depending on your procedure, you may have on your policies and procedures. You may already have a procedure for this, so you need to make sure that you do refer to that when looking at resolving uh, misconduct informally. Sometimes we advise to issue what's called a letter of concern that details of of the the shortcomings that you've identified by that employee and what you expect them to do in order to make sure that doesn't happen again. If you cannot resolve it informally, then you need to then notify the employee in writing that they are required to attend a disciplinary hearing. And we'll explore that in more detail in the upcoming slides. 
Okay, so differentiating between misconduct and a misunderstanding. So examples of mixed misconduct, for example, which you probably will be quite common with within the workplace, would be taking excessive breaks, incorrect patient file keeping, or rudeness towards patients and other staff. A misunderstanding may occur with surgeon or and patient miscommunication. Perhaps there's been a genuine personality clash, or perhaps there's been a cultural misunderstanding. Instances of gross misconduct would occur potentially, and I say potentially because it's always down to investigation and the case specific facts, that uh, that theft or pro theft of property may be considered gross misconduct, fraud or dis other dishonest conduct, gross medical negligence, serious sexual or racial harassment, for example, or ac accessing a patient med me patient's medical records without proper authorization or need. It's really important to differentiate between whether an incident is a case of misconduct or if it amounts to a misunderstanding. This is because the way the situation of misunderstanding would be handled di differs from the way a misconduct or gross misconduct issue would be handled. Misunderstanding can arise where there has been miscommunication between a dental surgeon and their patient, or indeed between two members of staff. For example, where a patient has complained about a de dentist prescription, causing more harm because they use it twice a day rather than once. Cases of genuine personality clashes also amount to a misunderstanding where members of staff fail to see eye to eye on a non-serious work-related issue. For example, poor communication skills that make collaborative working difficult. Poor communication skills from the part of the dental staff could give rise to misconduct if leads if 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 this leads to miscommunicating a patient's dental requirements, for example, failing to record a patient's symptoms correctly and leading them to not receiving the right care. So what about misunderstanding and what about what, what do we do when that happens within the workplace? So dealing with misunderstanding through mediation, mediation, is a non-evaluative non process where a neutral party assists a concerned party or two concerned parties towards understanding each other's perspective. Through this facilitates possible solutions to the situation. Mediation is not so concerned with legal rules, but, but with finding a resolution to the situation that parties can live with. The mediator's job is to help parties find that point where a consensus can occur and the mediator can be an internal or an external party depending on the seriousness of the issues at hand. It's really important that cases of misunderstanding should not be ignored as it could lead to more serious cases of misconduct or even sometimes gross misconduct if a conflict turns into harassment or violence for example. So what is the mediation process? First of all, parties must agree to mediate, and if, the follow and if so, the following steps should be taken. First of all, agree on the mediator. The mediator should be completely independent of the parties, and although there are no requirements in a voluntary process, it is recommended that experienced and qualified me a, a, an experienced and qualified mediator from a reputable dispute resolution organisation such as CEDR should be used. It may be of interest to you that we, are, we actually offer a service called our Peninsula Face to Face service. You can have trained mediators at an additional cost that come out to, to the practice and hold this for you and completely take it off your hands. A lot of our DDU members love this service and as they have about a 95 success rate of resolving workplace disputes that arise out of a misunderstanding. If you've appointed the trained mediator, whether that be internal or external, you then need to consider completing a mediation agreement. Once that, mis once that mediation has happened, it would be good to implement perhaps an action plan that you revisit every so often. And that 
that can be your that can complete your mediation agreement. If after a couple of weeks the mediation agreement is resolved and all action points have been completed, then it's a case of com communicating that with the staff and placing something on the personnel record file to ensure that mediation has been successful. Before agreeing the mediation, you need to agree a, a once, sorry, once you've agreed the, the mediation can take place, you need to agree a date, a time and a venue for the mediation. It is normal to set aside a whole day for a mediation. It is de desirable but not essential that this venue is on neutral territory. Approximately two weeks before the mediation, the mediator should contact the parties to explain the process, each party's role and what is expected of them. It is, it is essential that case summaries are completed. So for example, the parties should exchange a brief summary of their dispute setting out the facts, the evidence, the legal issues, and the nature of the dispute or grievance at least seven days before the mediation itself. A copy should also be sent to the mediator. Also, you would want the employees to think about what documents that they might want to provide. Any documents that the, imparti the parties intend to rely on are or are relevant to the dispute should be exchanged again at least seven days before the mediation and copied into the mediator. So, moving on from mediation, what is the importance of a thorough investigation? Why is it important? So, the investigation forms part of the disciplinary procedure for misconduct. Every allegation of misconduct should be properly and impartially investigated before formal disciplinary proceedings are started in order to establish all the facts that are relevant to the case. This will be particularly important in cases of alleged or suspected gross misconduct. An investigation may, for example, involve reviewing the employee's personnel records. This, for example, would be to check or whether unauthorised days off or perhaps lateness has, happened, has occurred quite frequently in the past. And therefore you need to decide whether the, the employee's lateness or, or unauthorised days are, begetting, are becoming unsustainable for the business and you need to take action. Those instances, for example, you may need to check the, the employee's personnel record. Other examples for ex are, are those where you might want to check whether the employee is on a, a warning or final written warning already and the escalating up through the next process could result potentially in a dismissal or a more severe sanction. In addition, any and all allegations made against an employee will need to be kept confidential and communicated only to those who have, who have a, had a role in the investigation. As part of the investigation, the employee who is accused or suspected of misconduct may also have to be interviewed. The purpose of any investigatory interview will be to establish facts only and not to judge the employee or make any decision about what action there is to take. It is important, and I can only highlight the, this, that it, it is important to ensure that no disciplinary action follows from directly from an investigatory meeting. It is important also that the person conducting the investigation is not the same as the manager who conducts any subsequent disciplinary proceedings. I appreciate that this may be dis difficult for a small dental practice, but where possible, the two stages, i.e. investigation and disciplinary, should be separate and handled by different people. As mentioned on my previous slide, if this proves impractical or potentially undesirable to management or a principal, and then, a and then, then the Peninsula face-to-face -face service I referred to before also offer a service where you could, they can come and do the investigation and or the disciplinary process for you. Please call the advice, advice line about your issues and let us know whether you want to know more about that service that they offer and what they can do. So remember, with an investigation, managers should carry out all necessary investigations to establish the facts. Where appropriate, there can be an investigatory meeting with the employee to gather evidence at which the, an employee does not have a right, but may be permitted to be accompanied. 
instances where they may be permitted is where you would need to refer back to your contract, employment handbook and or policies and procedures. At an investigatory meeting, the employee does not have an, a legal right to be accompanied under employment law. However, as mentioned, this may be enhanced by your own policies, procedures or contracts. So please check those when looking at investigating on holding an investigatory meeting. Employers may suspend an employee on full pay pending a completion of investigations and where investigations show that misconduct has or may have occurred, the employee should be informed in writing of the basis of the problem. The information provided to the employee should include any evidence provided by the witnesses and be su sufficient to enable the employee to pre 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 sorry, prepare the, uh, to answer the case. This is established in the case of British Home Stores and Birchall. This case established that before a dismissal is considered for misconduct, the Birchall case, it sets out why a, why a thorough investigation is necessary as well as other requirements. It also offers some insight into whether a dismissal for misconduct is fair or unfair. The facts of the case was that there were irregularities identified in staff purchases at one of the BHS stores. To determine who was responsible for this, BHS took evidence from dockets relating to purchases that staff had made and took witness statements from all. The evidence suggested that Birchall was responsible for the irregularities and she was later dismissed. Miss Birchall argued that BHS had not clearly established her guilt. It was interesting as this was the case that heard in employment, it was heard at an employment tribunal and the decision was taken to an employment appeal tribunal. The appeal tribunal stated there was no requirement to carry out an investigation at the level required in the criminal courts. In criminal law, there is a requirement to prove, prove guilt beyond all reasonable doubt. In civil law, this is different. In civil law, there is a requirement to have reasonable belief in the guilt on the balance of probabilities. The appeal tribunal set out three following steps that are required before dismissing an employee on the grounds of mis gross or misconduct. The employer must genuinely believe that the employee has committed the alleged offence. The belief must be based on reasonable grounds after appropriate investigation. And the investigation must be reasonable in all the circumstances. Each case of misconduct is very case specific. It's very it's important, therefore, that you ensure that you consider the facts and the evidence in every case that you have with misconduct. As taking witness statements may prompt you to, to look to take further witness statements. So if a tribunal decides that witness statements that would have been beneficial to potentially proving or disproving the misconduct should have been taken, then this could floor your process and therefore render the dismissal or warning unfair. OK, so once you've decided that the investigation warrants a formal disciplinary, you need to think, think about the importance of drafting your, your allegations. These allegations must be sound and clear. When inviting a, a person of suspected misconduct to a hearing, it is not only important to set out the time and the date of the hearing, but also the allegations they must answer for. For example, where misconduct concerns lateness, the allegations should be laid out to the employee in full. For example, you have been late on the following days for this length of time, etc., etc. It's important that you're specific as possible. This is so that the employer is able to the employee is able to answer to them and give a good response at the hearing and that they can sufficiently su prepare. Another example may be where a dentist provided substandard treatment to a patient. You need to lay out where this was, when this was, who the patient was, the name of the wrong, the, the wrong treatment and the name of the treatment that should have been administered. In all, 
the better the allegations that are outlined, the better the employee will be able to defend themselves. If employees don't understand the allegations levelled at them, they can't prepare accordingly and could cause the warning to be overturned or even a dismissal held unfair, resulting in an unfair dismissal claim at tribunal. So, overall, you need to ensure that all facts are set out and the employee in question knows what they are need, they need to answer for. You need to think about the whether the employees can defend themselves properly. If the employee in question is unprepared due to lack of sound allegations, then the, the hearing may need to be postponed, and this is a waste of time for all parties involved. If a decision is made to dismiss the employee who was not given the opportunity to defend the case, this could give rise to unfair dismissal claims at a tribunal. So, the overall overview of a, a disciplinary hearing itself. The employee should, with, without unreasonable delay, be invited to a disciplinary hearing. Having been given reasonable notice that, and told that the hearing is to be held under the employer's disciplinary procedure. The employee must be granted the right to be accompanied at any informal disciplinary hearing by a work colleague or trade union representative of his or her choice. Notice that this is different to the investigatory meeting as employment law extends the right to be accompanied at that disciplinary hearing. Failure, a failure to allow the employee to be accompanied may result in a claim for just for what would be just and equitable by allowing that person not allowing that person to be accompanied at the disciplinary hearing the employer should explain the complaint against the employee and go through the evidence that has been collected the employee should then be given the, a full opportunity to answer the allegations and explain his play, explain his or her conduct challenge the witness statements, ask any questions and present and, if she wishes or he wishes, call any relevant witnesses to support his or her case. The employee should, after the hearing, be informed in, in writing of the outcome of the disciplinary process. To reiterate, it is only important to provide sufficient information about the case against the employee to them and detail the possible consequences. Include any copies of any written evidence and any written, written witness statements. Pass case records to the manager who will be responsible for the disciplinary proceedings. Remember, you don't have to give an outcome at the end of the disciplinary and it's always good practice to adjourn. Certainly in cases of gross misconduct, it's better to adjourn at least 24 hours to make sure that you are showing the tri a tribunal should a claim be made that you've paid due consideration to the evidence presented to you at the hearing. If you are issuing a warning, it's good, good practice to extend uh, to adjourn for some time. But don't be afraid if you th think that you need to go away and investigate further and perhaps take further witness statements that as for, for issues that have come to you during the disciplinary hearing that you hadn't expected. And if that's the case, then please write to the employee to explain that the, the outcome has been placed on hold pending further investigation. Disciplinary should be held without unreasonable delay, remember. Notice should be given and also the right to be accompanied. Set out the complaint against the employee and the decision is to be given in writing. Any decision to dismiss the employee should be taken by a manager who has the authority to do so. So in summary, consider if, the, if a case is, misconduct, is a misconduct issue or a misunderstanding. Misunderstandings can be resolved through mediation. A proper disciplinary procedure should be followed and all allegations should be set out to the employees in question and in as much detail as possible. Thank you for listening to my session on misconduct or misunderstanding, and I open the forum up to any questions. Alison, are there any questions come through? Hello, Will. Thank you for that and uh, lots of really excellent advice there for everyone. Um, we have had some questions come through. The first okay. one, I think, that um, uh, is directed towards me. And the question was, is it OK to simply 
end a telephone call with a patient um, and uh, I can respond to that and say that you know generally we want to be helpful um, and polite and courteous to our patients so um, under normal circumstances that's not something that we would be doing but there may be uh, exceptional circumstances where it's necessary to end a telephone call in that way and I think I touched on some of them in my presentation um, if a patient has raised a complaint and it's really not productive or, or the conversation's going round in circles, it, it can be helpful to explain to the patient how that's going to be dealt with moving forwards, but that actually it's not productive to, to continue that, that conversation. The other scenario where it might be appropriate to be ending a telephone call from a patient is a patient where the practice has ended their dentist the practice patient relationship and the, the the patient is simply contacting the practice with no purpose and and, and there's nothing further that, that the practice may have to offer that patient of course if it is a complaint details of that complaint will need to be taken and in all those scenarios whoever's speaking with the patient i would suggest makes a a detailed record of the the verbal conversation the information the warning that was given to the patient before they chose to put put the telephone um down on them so um that was the question i think that that was directed at me um well i do have a question for you which is no. um why do you have to pay someone uh, full pay when they're suspended if it's their fault they're suspended okay that's quite an interesting question essentially your suspension will take place either during or prior to your your full investigation so at that point you won't have decided that whether that employee is at fault or not therefore for that reason if you didn't pay the employee you've potentially predetermined the outcome that they are at fault for number one and number two suspension is an action that the employee pl employer has taken in order to minimize risk to a the employer and b the employee or potentially any other staff so for that reason the employee should not be put at a disadvantage for not having them for being placed on suspension and therefore it would be breach of contract if they would not be able to uh, if they were not paid for that for that duration of the suspension i hope that answered that question for you great and and i have another one i think uh, uh, that you might be able to answer well and it's about um because practices are so busy and, and, and struggling to fit things in um, mm. that um, some uh, practice principals are struggling to have time to fit in um, normal appraisals with uh, the members of staff and, and ideally want to have one to one chats. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you got any sort of suggestions on how to overcome that that scenario? So essentially, um, appraisals are good, not only to, uh, they do help with uh, with misconduct because if people don't feel quite rightly appraised, then they may start um, p potentially act, behaving quite poorly as they've become in, dis, uh, unengaged. So it's really important that we do have those regular appraisals with our staff. It is difficult at this moment in time, um, but potentially, it's I, I I suppose really it it's hard because it's who do you delegate that to, unless you've got um, a particular person that picks up HR within the workplace. Um, but certainly, if you were to call the advice line, we can help you with any appraisal documents that you might need. Uh, we can give you something that you can work from, and potentially you know with with the the situation that we're in at the minute teams and things like that is used quite a lot so just a quick 15 minute teams call or something um outside the potential working hours if it works for people working um to do it out uh, you know uh, from the these of their own home or something like that then that could be something that that's available too Wonderful. I think that's a really good, a really good tip. Trying to, you know, make the time for these important things. Okay, um, I think we've, um, I think we've run out of time. We've we've come up to our our hour now. So, um, 
uh, I don't think we can fit in any further questions, but thank you to everyone for asking the questions. And just to say that this um, webinar will be added to the, the DDU's um, website if anyone wants to re-review it uh, at another time. So thank you very much, everyone, and good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.